My name is Dimitri Lipkin, Vice President of Corporate Communications at Aviatrix, and thank you for joining episode number three of Customer Flight Plans, The Journey to Multi-Cloud, with our host and CEO of Aviatrix, Steve Mullaney. We'd also like to welcome our special guest today, Michael Briseño, Associate Director of Cloud Architecture and Engineering at Raytheon Technologies, and Eric Derwij, Lead Cloud Architect at KPMG. During the show, the audience will be on mute, so if you have any questions, please type them into the Q&A section, and we'll respond to them accordingly. We will also have a couple of questions at the end for you to answer, so we appreciate your feedback. Thank you again for joining this episode, and without further ado, I'd like to hand this over to Steve. Steve, please take it away, and enjoy the show, everyone. Great. Thanks, Dimitri. Hey, uh, Michael, good morning. Eric, good afternoon. Great to have you on the show today. Yes, Dave. Thank Likewise. You. Yeah. Nice to and, be here. Um, you know, this one's a, an exciting one for me. Um, typically, what we do is we get a customer on and we and we talk about their, you know, the the, the technology and the business, so to speak, of at, for their company in terms of their journey to the cloud, and that's that's really interesting. But this one's kind of near and dear to my heart because it involves humans. You two guys. It's it, there's the technology, but the thing I've always said is the greatest you know, impediment to technology adoption is never the technology. It's all, the technology is always fine. It's the damn human. It's people. At the end of the day, it comes down to people. And so when you look at this, this, this transformation of the computing model that we're undergoing from client PC client server, which has been the model of computing the last 30 years before that mainframe, we're now entering this phase of cloud computing as a model of computing that was transforming the industry, it, it's creating the need for a new type of, of role called cloud architect that we didn't honestly have to have the last 30 years. And you know, the last time in IT and infrastructure we've really done architecture work was in 1992 when we created PC client server. And now we're doing that again. And so uh, to me, it's fascinating. Um, and, and, and there's a lots of opportunity for advancement and career and learning and so forth with this new role. So that's, that's really the purpose of today is to get these, these two great cloud architects and try to delve into what does it mean to be, a, what is a cloud architect? What, a, what do you do? How do you become one? What's important? How do you get your companies to move to the cloud and, 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 and kind of break out of the old model of computing and, and, and so forth. Because in a lot of ways, a cloud architect is an evangelist to try to get the company really to, to move into this new model. So that's what we're gonna to do today. We've got two, two great guests. Um, maybe we can first start by maybe you guys just giving a, a, just a quick update. Maybe Eric, I'll start with you. you know, who are you and what's your background and you know, what, do you, what do you do for KPMG? Um, my name is Eric Droy. I'm located in Amsterdam and uh, past time, if, if you look at my history, I've been starting at consulting, but actually more around delivery consulting and gradually moving into architecture, uh, enterprise architecture, cloud architecture. I think my relevant experience is uh, before KPMG was mostly in financial industries, a few of the Dutch banks, one of the larger trust funds in the world where I helped setting up an architecture capability. And now uh, the role at KPMG International, uh, holding the role of lead cloud architect. And it's mainly there to guide and uh, provide guidance for KPMG International to provide a global cloud platform for all of its member firms to actually onboard into the cloud and stay, go out of the traditional data centers and really embrace the cloud. And it's not just me, but I'm one of the guys and girls involved in that. Great. And Michael, how about you? Uh, sure. Um, so my name is Michael Bristino and uh, Steve, again, thanks for having us aboard on this. Um, uh, I do work for, uh, for Raytheon Technologies, uh, previously you, you, uh, United Technologies before that. Um, I've worked, uh, you know, for a little bit over 20 plus years in, in IT um, with uh, historically a networking background, but uh, I've done system administration, I've done enterprise architecting, um, so I've bounced around, you know, to the different, all the domain silos. Um, and I've worked in, in finance, I've worked in Wall Street, and I've worked in DOD in the, in the middle of the desert. So I've done a little bit of all spectrums of, of, uh, of IT work. Is, is... Yeah, did you ever get any UFOs out in that desert? No, no. I got a couple mortars, but no, oh, no okay. UFOs. So. <laughs> yeah. 
So, so but no, sorry. Oh, that's great. So, so obviously both you guys, you know, great experience uh, across multiple different industries. What is a cloud architect, Michael? You know, um, and it's funny that you say that. And, and, and going off what you said just, you know, a few minutes ago, you know, historically, we didn't have, that was not a position, right? I was a network architect, mm -hmm. moonlighting into, hey, what's this cloud thing? What are we going to do? Um, how are we going to get into it? And, uh, you know, it quickly evolved into a need right away where, hey, we need, to, we need people who understand little bits of everything right. uh, to transform this company. Yeah. Uh, you know, and it, it, uh, it, you know, like I said, it started off on one track and right away it, it turned into pulling all of the teams together, you know, talking to, you know, being that intermediate man between compliance and, and cyber and, and, and then the, the consumers themselves, the customers themselves, what do they want? Um, and then, um, you know, then with finance, you know, how do we save money? How do we drive synergies? How do we, we drive, um, you know, these, these opportunities that were, you know, contract renewals are coming up. Do we want to propagate or perpetuate legacy data centers? You know, mm -hmm. we really need some guy to, to kind of pull this glue together. Great. Eric, do you, do you, do you agree? Yeah, I think I do. If, if I look at my history, the, the, similarly, the role of cloud architect was never really recognized. This is the first time I actually came to an organization where they explicitly recognized the need and the role for a cloud architect. And I think what makes it different to uh, the types of architects that we already know is, is the multidimensionality of it. On one hand, and, and Michael already referred to it as well, it's the breadth. It's not just a silo which you're focused on. You need to kind of understand, at least have a reasonable grasp of all the silos involved in cloud, but not, not just that. It's also a vertical dimension. Um, it's not just technology architecture or data architecture or security architecture. You need to actually be able to, to a certain extent, cover the full spectrum, mm -hmm. get close to the business and be able to actually engage with them in business architecture kind of topics, but also understand how it would translate into a technology and what would be the security aspects of it. And just as Michael referred to as well, the, 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 the different other disciplines involved like legal or procurement. So for me, the cloud architect is actually sort of the spider in the web, bringing it all together and covering both the breadth and the yeah the height the vertical axis of architecture. Yeah. So do you do you I mean you both had mentioned you know kind of you know the breadth right? So it's not just the technology. So there there is a lot of the technology underneath, but also. I would say the business. I mean, in a lot of ways, when you think about the movement to cloud, it actually is not driven by technology. It's driven by the business. It's driven by the CEO and the board who yeah. says, we have an existential threat to the survival of our company and we need to digitally transform and we're gonna move to cloud. So do you find that this role is very much even a business architecture role as yeah. well? I mean, and when you say cloud, there's, there's technology, but but is a heck of a lot of business transformation and, and business architecture that has to go on. Do you, do you agree with that? Yeah, well, yes, there is. And uh, I think it's primarily because, because of the advent of cloud, it's uh, the consumption of technology is becoming much more easily. Um, so where in the past, you actually needed architects in the different silos to understand the depth of each silo, the, the delivery of the technology itself is becoming more easily consumable. So we can cover the depth, but it also means that IT is moving closer to the business. The business actually wants to get its hands on that IT themselves, and which is in essence a good thing, but it also needs a bit of guidance. And so, yes, the cloud architect is definitely closer, way closer to the business than traditional technical or application architecture would have been. And it's for me, it's a key understanding, understanding what drives a business, what is the business strategy and how do you actually translate that? How could cloud um, uh, help in achieving that business strategy? So do, you, do, you, do you find yourself getting pulled into more on the business side as well, Michael? Yeah, and, and I would say, to, I mean, to your point, I, I would say it's, it's, it's a, a two-pronged um, you know, response to that from a, from a, from a business value. You know, there's there's the speed of IT uh, and the speed of technology um, that that you need to remain competitive with your 
with your, you know, with your other, um, you know, uh, uh, comp- you know, competitors, you know, you need to be able to spin up these core services quickly. So there, you know, and cloud provides that platform to do that. Mm-hmm. So there's that, right? How do I stay competitive just from a core business process? How do I keep up with the speed of, of IT and momentum and new technologies? And then the other aspect is, as Eric was hinting at, how do I harness this um, for product? You know, how do I generate value, EPS value out of my IT based structure? You know, how do I, how do I merge these services with a, a, a business line or service line, right. um, make products or, you know, to pull AI data in, to get machine learning wrapped around to some of these concepts. So you're completely right. You know, if, if you don't harness those IT and the cloud in those two aspects, um, you will fall behind. Um, yeah. And I think we have some big companies out there, you know, with SpaceX and things like that, showing exactly um, how important it is to, to, you know, to keep up with your IT perspective. Right. Yeah, it's interesting. I've, 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 as I've been talk, I've talked to hundreds of enterprises, um, you know, over the last year, and you know, one one large Fortune 50 company, their infrastructure team called themselves the Application Enablement Group which I'd never heard in my, you know, 30, 35 years of, of IT, you know, and, and, and I thought that was really, that was really interesting. Um, you know, and, 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 and it goes back to that, to that, to that business. And I think another trend I've seen is, you know, and, and on-prem, the, 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 the different technologies were very siloed and the, and the network didn't talk to the storage or the compute or the applications or any of this other stuff. And they were effectively, people would call them ships in the night. They just had their own path and they didn't, they didn't never really interacted. And I think that's one of the advantages of, of cloud is to be able to go and do that. And one other thing I've noticed is, is the teams are actually sitting next to each other now, mm-hmm. you know, and, and the app team and the security team and the networking team, you know, in the past, they never talked to each other. And if they did, they hated each other. And I've, I've noticed in cloud, and so do you see the cloud architect role as, as a way to kind of start bringing those, those groups together and a, a transformation agent within these sure. companies? Sure, sure. And to your point earlier, the cloud architect is not just about technology. You know, as you said, it's people that get in the way of- The damn humans. Yeah, uh, you know, and you know, the cloud architect, you know, you're that liaison, you're, you know, you're that glue um, between those silos because you understand bits and concepts of all of them, you know, and, and, and you're, you're enforcing culture change, right? You know, I'm used to being .NET on bare metal and that's all I do. You know, you're the guy and go, okay, well, let me show you some alternatives. Right. Um, oh, and, and, you know, I'm used to just being in a CLI and a router. All right, well, let me show you how we can do this, you know, uh, differently. So, yeah. so definitely the, the cloud architect is that guy to drive that. Um, and, and you're going to have, you're going to have, uh, you know, anchors in in your in your staff or, or or in your environment and it's your job to to work at those anchors and, and show them the benefits and um, again none of that's technical and maybe some technical reasoning and facts showing out but a lot of it's saying hey let's get together let's find out hey cyber wants to meet these compliance objectives you know uh, finance needs to meet these objectives um, and cyber wants to make sure that's that we're controlled um, from you know a, a perimeter perspective let's do it and so that, again uh, it's a people thing at that point. Right. Uh, yeah, I think I'm quite convinced actually, Michael, that technology is the lesser part of what makes a cloud architect. It really is more about um, the people aspect and the change. Uh, if, you, if you really need to dive deep into the technology, you still have your engineers. And if I look at my experience, the, the engineers in a particular part definitely outskill me in their technical skills. Um, I think the key for a cloud architect is around continuously influencing and showing what cloud can bring and how it can bring it and also addressing um, the inhibitors for change primarily. So uh, the, the potentially the dinosaurs in the organization. And the other aspect for me is also around um, uh, more thinking along the lines of capabilities. What do we want to do as a company? What do we want to achieve? How do we want to achieve it? And then making the technology supportive rather than in typical traditional IT world, maybe making the technology the first and foremost point yeah. of an IT guy. Yeah, so one of, the, one of the things I always, this is a phrase we use at Aviatrix all the time, which, which I believe in and just in everything in life is architecture matters. 
good architecture, good life. You know, say ha ha happy wife, happy life. You know, uh, good architecture, good good life. Uh, bad architecture, your your life is pretty miserable. Um, you know, that's in your title, cloud architect. Um, yeah. You know, how important is architecture in all the different things, whether it's aviatrix in the network or just throughout the whole cloud? And do you do you get pushback from people that don't want to think about architecture? I think it's, uh, of course, I'm the first to say that architecture is hugely important. Otherwise, I would be minimizing my own role. But all kidding aside, I think Michael put it very well. Architecture is often the glue. And, but it's also, also it's often the thing that's not seen. Uh, I typically uh, correct, characterize architecture or architects as, as an insurance premium. Uh, you only know it when uh, you're only really aware of it when things go wrong and you don't have it. Right. And that's the annoying part uh, for, for architecture in general, sh showing the value of architecture. I'm, I'm truly convinced it is there but actually showing it and making it tangible is also a challenge because you typically, it's only seen once the architects are eliminated or not present yeah. and it goes wrong and then you can come back in to pick up the pieces. Right. Um, so I think, yes, architecture is important. Um, and it's, for me, it's still at times I struggle to, to quantify and qualify the value of it. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, you mentioned training and bringing Yep. you know, bringing people along. So, you know, at Aviatrix, we, we started the, the ACE program. I, I don't know if, it, I, Michael, maybe, I think you might be an ACE. I don't know, yep. Eric. Yep. You I did, I did ACE, yeah. Yeah, good. So, um, uh, stands for Aviatrix Certified Engineer. So, um, we, we looked out a year and a half ago and said, okay, we're gonna have this move to cloud. And again, back to, it's the human, we gotta bring these people along. I mean, these companies, you can't just fire all your IT people and say, we're going to cloud and you're not coming with us. No, you need to come with us. And, and they're gonna need training. And we looked and we said, you know what? The networking people, the network security people are gonna need multi-cloud networking training, right? They're gonna need, so our ACE training teaches, teaches people multi-cloud networking, not just one cloud, all the clouds. Yes, they learn a little bit about Aviatrix, but it's very similar to what Cisco did in the 90s, the early 90s with CCIE. You learned IP networking and oh yes, a little bit of Cisco, mm. but we now have over guys, I don't know if you know this, but we're probably at about 10,000 ACE certified people right now. It was 9,000 a little while ago. We just announced um, a couple months ago, our 5,000th ACE. By the time the press release came out, we were already at 7,500. It's just, it's, it's nuts. So what are, what do you think about training and is, do you agree with everything I said? And, 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 and is that something that you, you, you try to push your organization um, towards? Yeah. I mean, you have to, you absolutely have to, and, you know, and I think what you're going to see, um, you know, as an architect or someone already in, in your IT department is you're going to see the folks who, who have that passion, um, who, who want to know more, whether it's about cloud specific or just IT in general, you know, that you, they're going to have the passion there, but they need that basic understanding of how, uh, you know, from their original silo or the original discipline um, into to the cloud. And, and the ACES provides a really good platform for them to do that. And, and you absolutely got to do it. So, you know, you can't just talk to somebody cold turkey, um, you know, old school network. Hey, you, you know, transit gateways, VPCs, direct connects, VIST, you know, express routes. You know, they're not going to know what that means. Um, so. They absolutely need that training and you don't want to put them in your, obviously your live production area to do that. So, you right. know, get them there. I think what I've seen, everybody's very appreciative of just getting an opportunity to train. Um, definitely worth it, um, you know, uh, and I highly recommend it. So, yep. and folks, and even for folks who ever touch certain parts of, of the network, but maybe an application owner, you know, I need to understand how this works. I, it helps me understand that, you know, um, the cyber team, they may, they may never touch the Aviatrix console or the controller, but they should know what it does and how it works. And, and, and actually, I think it pulls the, the picture to, of cloud together better for them. Yeah. So definitely uh, for everybody, not just the network guy or not just the cloud guy. I think agree that training is, is a really key thing. Um, 
I think you have to. You're forced to do it in, in one sense because um, if you could go out and, and recruit cloud architects on the market, there are just not enough cloud architects available on the market. So you would have to, you're forced to train. So that's kind of the negative side to it maybe. But on the other hand, you often have a great set of people already in your organization. They want to learn. They want to diversify, given the opportunity to do so. And, and not just when going into the cloud, but it's going to be a continuous path of learning because the rate of change and the rate of innovation is only going to, uh, it, well, it remain high and maybe even further increase. So without training, you your people will run behind. So yeah, it's it's inevitable. Yeah. And it's a good thing to invest in your own people. Like yeah. That. So uh, let me change it around a little bit. So for other cloud architects that are listening or future wannabe cloud architects, um, what are some lessons learned from each of you guys? What are, what are some things that, you know, things that you did right that really worked out, things that if you had to do it all over again was a disaster, you never would have done it that way. Anything that you can share with uh, listeners. Eric, why don't you go first? I think one of the pitfalls that I originally fell into is just looking at cloud as a different kind of delivery model, like an IT consumed as a service. It's, I underestimated the difference that the, the concept of cloud brings to an organization. Uh, initially, I looked at it, it's just a different way to consume IT rather than doing it in your own data centers or higher data centers. Now, it's, it's, Yes, in essence, it is a delivery model, but the possibilities that it brings are, uh, I underestimated those. So my tip to, to potential or new cloud architects would be really be is don't think of it as the cloud just being someone else's computer. Yep. Yes, in theory it is, but it is it offers you so much more capabilities and um, exploit that. And that is where the value is to be had. Great. So, so how about great. how about one? Uh, I'm sure there's many, but one example of something you did right that they should replicate. Um, when you come into an organization, or an organization is is about to enter into the cloud, just take a moment and stop to think: what is what is your cloud strategy? Why do you want to do it? And and how you want to get there? And what value do you think it's going to bring you? Um, just going into the cloud for the sake of cloud is probably not the best way to do it. Mm -hmm. And just lifting and shifting your existing stuff into the cloud is also not gonna be the way to do it. It's probably gonna be more expensive than doing it in traditional manners. Mm -hmm. So you really wanna think of but why are we doing this? What are we trying to achieve with it? And then quantify this and, and define those benefits in terms of business benefits. It's not an IT thing at its core. It's a business thing and it's supported by IT. So start off with the cloud strategy based on business benefits. And um, I did that in my previous employer and it, it, it gives direction, it gives clarity on why we're doing things. And it makes sure that it's not just an IT party, it's, it's not an IT thing, it becomes a business thing. Yeah. No, I think, I think that's great. I think that, that really gives you alignment with everybody, yeah. you know, where you, you've got that high definition destination and it's, and it's tied to the business as opposed to just you know, this technical reason or that technical reason. No, this is why we're doing this as a company. And it gives yeah. everyone that, that true north. So then that way they can make their own decisions based on that. If they don't know where we're going, you know, I always say to people, if, you know, should I go left or should I go right? And I say, well, where are you? Where are you, where are you going? And they say, I don't know. And then I say, well, then it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Flip a coin, <laughs> go either way. Because if you don't know where you're going, I can't help you. So- do I think tell them where we want to go. And if you do that's tell them where point. we want to go, if we agree on where they want to go, they can actually find a route there themselves. So yeah. you don't have to tell them how to get there. Just tell them where we want to be and articulate yeah. it and let yeah. them, they're smart enough to find a way themselves. All right, Michael. Good, uh, good yeah. lesson learned, a lesson learned uh, that you didn't do correctly and lesson learned that you, 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 you did right. Ooh, okay, well, we made a lot of, I made a lot of bad mistakes, that's for sure. No. Um, you know, Eric touched on the big ones, but I, I think, you know, I think what's going to happen for a lot of cloud architects coming up and, you know, into, um, into the game and, and trying to get into it is you'll find yourself and I, and I even do this even today, four or five years later, um, you know, um, uh, defaulting to your base discipline. Uh, and it's a lot of times for me, you know, I'll talk cloud and I go heavy network, heavy network, heavy network. 
and 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 uh, that's a fraction of it. So I, I would say one recommendation for any uh, cloud architect or someone moving into it. I mean, it's a great foundation, your base discipline, but don't tie yourself and design and tie your architectural designs to your base discipline um, because it, it skews the view of cloud and it skews the consumption of cloud for the rest of your customers. Um, you know, if I go to an app team and talk network, their eyes roll in the back of their heads, right? They don't really care about that part. Um, but the network guys and, and, and firewall guys do. So that would be one of the biggest pitfalls. Don't get stuck in your discipline. Um, and the second one is you, you gotta you gotta document documents um, because if you know you get two down two years down the road and go oh I have an audit or I have you know I need these playbooks written or I I'm I'm hiring thirty new people to my team you know and they go hey where are the playbooks or the architectural reference designs and you're like ah, I got a couple of visios that's 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 not going to work so stay on top of your docs um, right. and get those published and clean somewhere right. Um, and, and for things that we did well, um, you know, the, I would say one of the things we did really well was leverage our partners, you know, um, leverage your partners, you know, and the vendors that you're working with, um, get those best practices, get those ideas, um, you know, to help you formulate, um, you know, there's a bunch of people who've done this before. Doesn't mean you need to copy them, but get the concepts down and understand ways people are doing this and, and way people are delivering the services. Um, don't reinvent the entire wheel. Again, you can make your tread a little bit different, but leverage your partners. And we did that really well, I think, um, uh, you know, with our, with our journey. That's great. Actually, that's great advice from you guys. I, I <laughs> you know, um, hopefully people appreciate that. I, I always find that interesting. You know, that's one thing I always ask people. Um, first, first time I was a CEO, I asked Scott Krenz, who was CEO of Juniper. He's, he's a friend of mine. And I called him up right out of the blue and and I was a first time CEO. And I said, Scott, you're a pretty successful CEO. What was your lesson learned for a first time CEO? And I caught him off guard and, and he had just a, a perfect, perfect answer. And just when you ask people that, I thought you guys answered was great. Cause it's just, it, it wasn't rehearsed. You didn't know I was gonna ask that. And it's just like, it's just, it's just perfect. But Scott told me, he said, never underestimate the power of intention. And, uh, and then he said, hands on the wheel, eyes on the road. You got to execute to get to that intention. He said, life is like, like, a, like a puzzle. You got to put that puzzle, you know, you're going to make that puzzle, put the, put the cover on there and then say, I'm going to go build that puzzle because all the pieces you have on your table to are, are about like a hundred puzzles. They're not all your puzzle. And you have to pick the pieces you want and have that intention to go build that puzzle. But anyway, I, I, I think it's, uh, I, I love the, con the, the feedback that you guys had in terms of just lessons learned, I think is very, um, yeah. very good for, for future cloud architects and even people that are cloud architects now. So what, um, another question I like to ask, um, which, which uh, is typically boards ask this question of CEOs all the time. What keeps you up at night? Michael, what keeps you up at night? Um. Yeah. So, you know, obviously in our business, you know, uh, any type of exposure, whether it be an exfil um, or, or an infiltration attack, you know, and, and something that you know, keeps me up is did I architect this in the best way possible? You know, it, was there any gap with this? Um, you know, it, is, did I leave a, a hole that I'm just not seeing because of the way I'm, my perspective on, on this build? Um, you know, so, and I think I just think that's shared with, with many people who operate in cloud and, and many of our cyber folks, um, you know, here as well. Um, so I would say, you know, that those aspects are what bothers me. Um, the second one would be is, is, can my operational team handle something, you know, at 2 a.m. too? You know, have I provided enough documentation, enough details uh, to the engineering team and the transition team um, so they're self-sufficient, um, you know, and what they do? And do they have the right tools um, available? So those two concepts, I think, are the ones that. Okay. So it's interesting. I'm just looking, Michael, at the, there was a question that came in that said, my teams are so focused on getting functionality, but they don't think about visibility. How do you prioritize operations in your architecture decisions? I think that goes along with what you just said. Yeah. Well, you know, and that goes uh, to one of the points, you know, that, that Eric was talking about earlier, right? It's, it's all silos are involved with the architectural design in the first place, including operations and, 
And obviously when you're moving to a cloud environment, you're looking at things like IAC infrastructure as code. You're looking at those platforms that, that are gonna um, you know, automate and, and build your, your infrastructures and your support models. And, and you have to build your op models in by default, you know, and you have to build your login modules by default. Um, you know, uh, for us personally, we won't release a service as a service line until we have full operational, you know, playbooks defined for it. Uh, we need to have some type of ops monitoring, um, you know, um, detection and, and retention or remediation processes. Those are absolutely critical. Um, yeah. I, I would say you don't need to solve everything because if you try to solve everything, you'll never get anything done. You know, there's a lot of folks in our industry who talk about cool things, only percentage of them actually do cool things. So be a person who does cool things. Um, uh, but again, you can't leave ops out of that mix. So, Yeah, I always like to say day one is one day of your life. Day two is every damn day of your life. <laughs> if, you get, if you get that wrong, you know, yep. people yeah. sometimes forget about, you got to operationalize it. And it can't just be, you know, your one hero in your organization who yep. scripts something up and he gets it all configured. But then what do you do when something goes wrong? As it always does. Something's not working right. Oh, well, we don't have the visibility. We don't have the day two operations. And, and, and where's the hero? Oh, the hero quit. He's not with us anymore. Great. Yeah. Now what do we do? Exactly. Exactly. All right, Eric, what, what keeps you up at night? I think for the first point, I have to, to agree with, with Michael as well. It's uh, the, the risk of exposure. Yeah. Uh, because it comes it's becoming so easy to consume cloud services. It's it's also very easy to actually have a mistake in there and to over overlook things. And it's often not even the intent to make a mistake or to create exposure. People are just willing to generate, uh, to create a functionality and generate value. And in the slipstream of that, they actually forget the risk that there could be involved in some cases. So that's the exposure and keeping things safe and secure and compliant. How do we do that? And how we actually get, how do we keep sight on that? That's one of the things that keeps me up at night. Yeah. The other thing is uh, more of a personal thing. Um, have, I, have I thought of everything? Have I made the right choices? And um, have I not get stuck in over and over analyzing instead of just doing? And I believe Monica also referred to that as well. You can be part of the group of people that actually does things or be yeah. part of the other group. Um, personally, I have a tendency at times to, to doubt myself and uh, be part of the group that overanalyzes. Mm -hmm. At times, I need to kick myself and actually spring into action mode. It's better to to do and then have to correct it later on within yeah. within reasonable bounds than to not move at all. Yeah, I think that's an interesting thing. One of the, uh, Another customer told me that the definition, so when you think of mission-critical systems, so what, you know, everything in enterprise is all about mission critical, right? So in mainframe, that world, it was all about, you know, yeah. mission critical and five nine, same on on-prem. How do we deliver that, that mission critical um, enterprise class functionality of, you know, with the security, the reliability, all that kind of stuff. And sometimes you can go too far. And now in cloud, the word agility is actually part of mission critical. You know, it can't just be, you know, in the past, 10, 15 years ago, you, you know, the business units would ask IT something and the response from IT would be, what year do you want that in? And the business units would say, what year? Like, I need that next week. So guess what? I've got a credit card. I'm going to AWS. And, and so, and it created shadow IT, which is not good for the enterprise. And when we move into cloud now, the enterprise is saying, we can't do that anymore. We have to be, we're regulated industry. We're going to have audits. We're going to have all the things you guys are talking about, but yet we can't go back to the old non-agile way that says 2022 or 2023, do you want that? Like, that's not going to work. So everything that you say is, so it's like, I need all that visibility, all that control, all those, all that stuff, but yet I need it in an agile way um, is, is really the tension, I think, that you guys are saying. Yeah, and that, that struggle it really is one of the hardest things to balance, actually. How can you still deliver on time and generate value, but also make sure at least you've got sufficient level of compliance and security yeah. insurance in there? But, you know, but one of the things is I think that, um, that happens, though, with cloud is everything's as code, even yeah. the infrastructure. I mean, 
even with, with aviatrix solution, you can terraform it. And so guess what? Humans make really bad distributed systems. They, they, they take vacation, they, make, they fat finger things, they're slow. I mean, the more that you can automate and have things as code, is a, is, a, is, is, is a much better way because that's typically where the problems, like you talked about, did I do something wrong? Typically what happens, it's some person. Yeah. They messed it's something up. Patients, but it's still a person. And yeah. uh, I think it's currently we're driving a lot towards automation and it's on one hand, it's efficient. On the other hand, it's eliminating mistakes. And do mind that if you make a mistake in an automation, it's a big mistake, right? As of day one, but if you get it right, it brings yeah. you a lot of peace of mind. Well, that's the other problem with automation. Uh, another customer told me, you know what automation means? Faster to disaster. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that is the risk of automation. You could be very careful. Yeah. You, yeah. Um, what about multi-cloud? I mean, that's, you know, two years ago, there was no, there was no such thing as multi-cloud. Everything was AWS. Uh, recently, I've seen AWS now recognizes the word multi-cloud. Um, yeah. You know, what, what, what do you guys think of that? What, what, what are your thoughts on multi-cloud? Um, I'll, I'll take this one first, Eric. Eric. And, and you're right, Steve. You know, Jesse what, talked about it, what, last week, right? And, yeah. and reInvent himself, you know. Uh, you know, and, and I think what you're going to do is you're going to definitely have people in those comfort levels If I've done this before. I'm, I'm very, I'm a Microsoft shop. I'm really used to Microsoft, so Azure makes sense. Or I've been in AWS before and I like AWS. The, the thing about it is they both have pros and cons to their platforms. They both have pros and cons to their SLAs, their, their availabilities, um, you know, and, and, and they may even have, um, it may be something more at home. You may have a TAM that you work with really well, you know, in your region. Um, but I would say, and, and depending on the size of the company, obviously, um, I think that will help dictate how much exposure of multi-cloud you'll see. But, um, you, you know, you need to, you know, you need to, you need to invest in both. Um, you need to see where workloads make sense for you. Um, you know, you may have certain workloads that, that, that you're, it's 30% premium running in this platform over this platform. And, and, and does it make sense just because I feel better about it to pay that 30% premium? Maybe, maybe not, you know. Um, you know, maybe this other platform has some other stuff that's embedded to some of the other work processes I work with, or workflow processes. So maybe it makes sense to use this one. So um, I think if you're not thinking multi-cloud, you're, you're doing yourself a disservice um, and you're doing the company a disservice, unless there's some underlying reason why you just yeah. natively can't do it. So. Right. Yeah, I think I'd say in terms of multi-cloud, I would say tread carefully. I think in my experience, I, I have, ultimately it will be inevitable, yes, larger companies will have multi-cloud strategies or will have workloads running across multiple clouds. Uh, but I've also seen companies wanting to do that too fast. And in the regulated industry, actually they had to take a step back and get out of one cloud and go back to a single cloud because it was already quite difficult to uh, have a mature cloud adoption in, in one cloud already. So is it, it's inevitable, yeah. But don't over rush it. Don't rush it. Just yeah. make well-founded choices what workload needs to go where and take into account things like um, uh, the difference in skill sets that you might need, data gravity, the difficulty of moving data around between cloud platforms. And maybe it is worthwhile to accept somewhat higher costs in one cloud, uh, but it gives you a single set of skills to manage, a single platform to manage, and gives you benefits in other areas. So, yeah, make well-founded decisions and don't yeah. just no cloud. Uh, I, I, I've seen take. Um, what I've seen is exactly what you say, Michael. Is 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 the, the typically, and it's kind of the conversation we've had is the business decides. Actually, you know, the infrastructure team doesn't get to decide. It's not a decision you make. The the business decides, and I've seen that happen over and over and over again, where the business, the application teams actually say, this is where I want to run my workload. And I don't think people have multi-cloud applications, meaning I'm going to make this thing span across three different clouds. Nobody does that. Right. What they do though, is that app or that BU says, for whatever reason, like you said, Mike, for this reason, I'm going to run in GCP. And you've got another BU or you've got another part of the business that says, I, I've started on AWS, I'm gonna run on AWS. And another part says, I've got an Oracle database, I'm gonna use Oracle. And 
And what ends up happening is that architecture, you need to be able to support all that. And it's not that you've got one app that's going, I don't think anybody's going to do that. And nobody ever arbitrages and says, well, I could run it on AWS, but I can save 10 or 20% if I run it on uh, Oracle because Larry's going to give me a better price. Nobody does that, right? I mean, it, 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 they run it where it needs to run best and, and there's not going to be that arbitrage. And I always like to say, people, you know, people always think it's not because I don't want to get locked in. Actually, humans like being locked in. They do. I, I'm a 100% Apple customer. Why? Because I know it's all going to work together. So, so the infrastructure team actually would like to just be one cloud. But what I find is they don't make the decision. It's the business that makes a decision. And you have to architect that in because you're going to have multiple business units. And I see that happening over and over and over again. Thank you. Um, another person just asked, uh, uh, what is your thought on build versus buy when going into cloud? For some customers, there may be a tendency to build everything and hiring bodies to support the effort only to realize it's keeping them away from business innovations. How do you guide decision makers when they are early in their journey? Um, typically, in, in, in general, I'm tending towards buy. If, if there is stuff on the market that actually suits your needs, then don't go into building it yourself. What's the value of trying to rebuild what's already out there on the market? Um, you should only invest in the build effort for those things that actually give you additional value, like a competitive advantage that the others don't have. So choose wisely in that sense. And if it's relatively commoditized, go for buy. And if it's giving you an advantage, then consider build, but then um, make sure you prevent somewhat sprawl. Uh, you can build everything in every different kind of technology. Um, it's going to bite you in the end because you need to still support it and keep the skills on board for all of it. Yeah. So I would say, Steve, my answer to that would be, you know, it depends, right? It always depends. Uh, it depends on data class, it depends on your, you know, uh, uh, what you're building and where you're building it um, and all that. What I would say is um, a lot of folks get into the rut of a lift and shift mind frame, you know, Hey, it's on bare metal today. It's on VMware today. It's on you know Citrix today. Let me just spin an IaaS box up and rebuild it there, and then um, and then I just migrate my app there. Sure, that, and that that may be uh, that may be the best way for that that particular application or, or what you're doing. But I would say don't underestimate you know the the cost savings and everything else that come with using something that's already pre built. You know, looking at like an EKS or an AKS you know foundation maybe don't have people. That, that understand, hey, how am I going to deploy ECS or, or containers on bare metal or mesos or something like that? And I don't have people who understand how to host a registry and and, and understand Docker, you know, um, and, and, and the pipeline involved with that. So, uh, you know, depending on your, again, your talent and the people you have, um, and I would gauge the passion of the folks. You know, you may have folks who want to learn it and you maybe you have an avenue, going up again, back to the training aspect, or maybe there's an opportunity so I can retain some talent. I have a talent. He's borderline getting ready to leave. Maybe here's a, there's a talent, uh, a, you know, possibility here to train this guy, get him in there, and I can build part of this. Um, but I would say definitely don't underestimate the, the already pre-built, you know, because those past services, um, you know, also, you know, th there's a cost savings to them, right? Mm -hmm. You know, running RDS or, or, or Azure SQL, it's much cheaper than running EC2 VM with, with SQL 2019 licenses on them and the DB administrator that it takes to run it. Um, so again, it really depends on your team on the build and buy, but I wouldn't, I, I would definitely try to consume more past services and, and, and functions and lambdas um, as possible. Yep. Great. All right. Well, this guys, this has been great. One, uh, one last question for, for both you and then, then we'll wrap this up. But uh, what are you excited about? looking out into the future, you know, for cloud and, and in kind of your role as a, as a cloud architect, how, how do you, anything that you are excited about future wise, Eric, why don't you start? I think what I'm excited about future wise is the continuing rate of innovation that's happening. It's uh, it's, it's not slowing down. It's speeding up if anything. Um, Although it's giving me challenges, it is also cool. I, it really drives me to kind of stay on, stay on board with the technology innovation, see what it can actually mean to the company and, and get the most out of it. Um, um, personally, 
my drive would be becoming a better cloud architect and moving closer to the business, being able to actually generate that value, sell it, evangelize it. You used the word in the beginning, continue that, continuing to evangelize the value of cloud for companies. That is what driving me forward. And I think that's what I'm looking forward to. Yeah. Michael. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of things I would say, Steve. Obviously, I mean, it's 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 multiplying the the services available. You know, every every few weeks it seems there's something new and cool coming out. But I would say one of the things that excites me the most, as weird as this may sound, is the new talent that we're getting from you know from university level, you know, um, you know, local colleges um, and, and four year colleges, things like that. You know, these 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 guys are learning they're learning IT differently than how we learned it 20, 30 years ago. Yeah. They're, that's interesting. Yeah. They're learning dev chain differently. They're, they're learning block led, you know, blockchain ledgers differently. And they're learning how to harness AI, you know, in ways where we, we conceptualize it. We know how to do it. We know how to inject data right. in, in, in that, but um, it's really interesting seeing these guys come in. And, and that's one thing that we always try to do is, is get interns and, and programs and things like that. Yeah. Some of these young guys coming out with some really cool ideas and girls, you know, we have the whole girls for code, you know, who code, um, right. has, they come in and, and they think of some really cool stuff. And I think oh, that's great. the coolest thing is seeing these new ideas on this new platform and what can we make, um, you know, that, that's the next cutting edge thing. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Well, hey, I want to, I want to thank you guys, Dimitri. I don't know if you have any, any closing, but I want to thank you guys. I thought this was a, 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 a very, uh, interesting, and I and I actually enjoy this uh, tremendously, and 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 love having conversations with you guys. So, thank you so much for for participating. Thank you for having us. It was, thanks, uh, yeah. it was thanks, Steve. Thanks, guys. Uh, thanks, thanks Steve. Here. And I just want to close uh, again. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Eric. Great conversation. Uh, really appreciated your time. Thank you to our attendees. Uh, we had a great turnout. Uh, please take a look at the questions that we have for you guys to answer. There's a couple at the end. Uh, as we really value your feedback and uh, have a great holiday season. And uh, thanks again. Stay tuned for episode number four. Take care, right. everyone. All right. Thanks, guys. See you guys. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.